next day. Um, the penultimate story of the evening is Fat Man in Neon by Jason Jackson from the May 2019 event, Incendiary. Jason Jackson has lived in the Southwest for over 20 years, although he is originally from the Northeast. He's currently working on a collection exploring the insecurities and joys of life in modern Britain. Jason is also a street photographer and his images portray similar themes. So, to read Fat Man in Neon, please welcome Jason Jackson. Fat Man in Neon. He picked me up in biblical rain outside of the services, slowing on the slip road, flashing his lights. Don't get many hitches nowadays, he said when I climbed in. Don't get many lifts, I said. He turned into a gap in the stream of traffic. How far north? Sunderland. Edinburgh myself, he said. Pleasure or business. That felt like enough conversation. The winter clouds were a shroud over everything and the rain on the windscreen flickered like costume jewels. What's in Sunderland? said the fat man. Fuck all, I said. Fair enough, you want some of this? Without taking his eyes off the road, he held out a small plastic baggie between his forefinger and thumb. White powder, more than enough to get him to Edinburgh without a care. I took it, licked my little finger, dipped it in, took a taste. Here, he said, handing me a credit card. Use the dash, I'll keep it steady. I cut a thin line. It was better than I was used to. I weighed the baggie and the credit card in my hand as I looked at the fat man. I thought about our velocity, about punching him hard in the face. I thought about what might become of us if I acted on impulse, about whether I cared. Cut me one, he said. You're not on a dash. Where? On your thigh, he said. Sometimes I'm a good boy. Sometimes I do what I'm told. I made his line thicker and longer than mine, and I cut it so it led where he wanted it to lead. He pulled into the slow lane, kept his right hand on the wheel, bent down over me, and I watched the back of his shaved head, the ridges of his neck against his collar, thick white slopes. He sat up. And with his eyes fixed on the road again, he started to listen to jingle bells. It was Christmas Eve. We drove for five hours doing a line an hour, me from the dash, him from my thigh. And his smile got wider each time we came up for air. There was talk between us, the nonsense and nothing and flirtation. And it filled the time until he slipped for Sunderland loomed out of the rain. Anywhere particular you need to be, he said. The cafe, Neon, it's called. Open Christmas Eve, he said. Uh, shut down, has been for a month. I was watching the space, far over to the right, where the ocean lay hidden. The proprietor got sick, I said, then he died. He smiled, so how do we get in? I rummaged in my pocket, pulled out an old leather key ring, two long, thick keys attached. I waved them back and forth. Dead man's fingers, I said. Mid-November, in a pristine solicitor's office, south of the Thames, a praying mantis of a man handed me a letter written by another solicitor. A week later, I picked up the keys. My father had left me nailed. I'd known nothing of a funeral, 
or even an illness. I'd heard nothing of them for 10 years. I had no idea how they found me. I didn't care to ask. It was more than a month ago. It felt as if I hadn't slept since. Edinburgh's still three hours away, said the fat man, watching the rain quicken on the windscreen. What's in Edinburgh? I said. He smiled. Oh, cool. It suddenly seemed to me an insane thing to be alive and aware on the night before a Christmas morning. I tried to remember the last night, but it was like sifting for fool's gold. I'm going to show you Neil, I said. Well, now we have a plan, I said. I leant my head against the window, hypnotised by the rhythm of the streetlights as we passed under them, taking their blessings one by one. We were getting closer. There were tall Victorian terraces, looming on the left, filled with the curtain glow of hidden lives. And then the Christmas lights began, reds and greens and gold strewn and crisscross over the road and stretching off ahead of us. Over to the left is the black expanse of the North Sea, the heaviness I always held in my heart. Next block along, I said, and then there. The fat man pulled into the curb. It was past eleven. There were people around, couples holding hands, huddled against the rain, groups stumbling along. The pub was open in a Chinese restaurant, but neon itself was cast in darkness. I pulled my backpack from the seat well between my knees and got out of the car. The rain was hard. The wind was terrible. I slammed the passenger door shut and as I fumbled for the right key, I found the driver's door slammed to. And then I was inside. The fat man followed. I negotiated the shadows and the silhouettes of the scattered mannequins which filled the place. Give me a second, I said, as I picked my way through the storeroom to the back. I wanted the fat man to experience the full ridiculousness of my father's folly. And for that, I needed the lights. I can't see, he said, as if speaking from some distant planet. Are you coming back out? And then he started to laugh. <laughs> You're a tease, he said, of hearing shuffling around. Come on, I've got something to show you here. Let me show you first, I said. And I pulled the lever. A father with an idea. A father with a pension. A father who purchased a cafe. A father who bought up all the neon signs he could find. From everywhere and anywhere. Car boot sales, auctions, the internet, America, Germany, Japan. A father who wanted people to see. A father who waited and waited. Who tried to entice people in. And when they didn't come, his father bought some people of his own. Wrapped them in lines of bulbs, stood them amongst the potential of the signs, then switched everything on. In the storeroom, the strip of light under the closed door pulsed in waves of energy as if some fantastic alien birth was happening beyond it. I heard the fat man gasp. For the love of God, he said, this place. I opened the door and walked into the room. The fat man was naked, a small, hard cock bobbing beneath his hairy belly. All around them were pulsing, nonsensical neon signs, coloured pink and blue. All night refilled, smoke a pork, your friends are forever, live life in the fast lane, drink Echo Beach Lager, K Love, K Hate, K Pop, the Who, all night strip, silence, twist and shout. No cameras live amongst us forever and be free. He stretched out his arms, tipped his head over to the right, like some kind of lit up corpulent Christ, and laughed. I could do no other than go to him. I could do no other 
and smiled. He embraced me, and I saw the ghost of my father counting the meager takings in the corner. The ghost didn't seem to care now what happened in his lost citadel of light. This place, whispered the fat man. He shook his head, grasped my face in his thick little fingers, and kissed me hard. I could smell the drive and the sadness of the season on him as I pulled away. It's mine, I said, and my sins. One of the mannequins was behind him, all sculpted pecs and carved abs and a plastic mound between its legs. There was wire wrapped around this angel, strung with bulb after bulb after bulb, silver lights beautiful and strange. I lifted it, turned round, and placed it into the fat man's willing embrace. Here, he said, smiling. And they began to dance. The crazy signs put in the rhythm, while a silent congregation looked on. The fat man laughed, whirling and turning, his new lover weighing almost nothing, and his life suddenly full. The front door had closed, but I went to it, and I opened it wide. It was Christmas, and time once again for Neon to be filled with the cold and the pity and the hope of this unimaginable world. Thank you.